There's a track in the middle of the Finger Lakes, surrounded by natural beauty from the rolling hills to the vineyards. For the slopes here are rich with the soil it deposited, rich and carefully tended. Here are the Bristol Hills, the famous wine country of Western New York. This track is just a few hours from New York City and Rust Belt cities like Rochester, Buffalo, and Syracuse. This track hosted music festivals that were bigger than Woodstock. The biggest rock music gathering in four years. Maybe the biggest ever. Estimates of the crowd now crammed together at range from 300,000 to 500,000 people. Now sit back, relax, crack open a Jenny, and dive into a plate of buffalo wings. This is Track History on Walk and Fun. I live in North Carolina, but I love New York. I love New York. This summer, see some of the most beautiful outdoor country in the world in New York State. Today, Watkins Glen's main street is just another road in upstate New York. But 25 years ago, it was the scene of a bold new experiment in American motor racing. Its public image thrives on a single event, that great autumn happening known as the United States Grand Prix. But the real action is happening behind it. Peter Repson's number nine javelin whips by George Homer. That makes the prospects of the American Motors team very rosy indeed. And the green flag is out and we are racing the Budweiser with the Glen underway. We're glad you can be with us on this Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Oh, there's a spin. Matthew Dirks has gone around. This is going to be another big one. Huge incident. Oh, Huge incident. It'll turn on the course. Jeff Gordon has won the Bud at the Glen. And here in 1997, securing his spot atop the NASCAR Winston Cup point standings. Hey, everyone. I'm Daniel Arena. Welcome to my channel. And this is Track History on Watkins Glen. Now, this track history is very personal for me. I grew up in Rochester, New York, and it was only a two-hour drive from the track. Have you ever heard of Genesee fever? Historically, it was probably some kind of rash encountered by Colonel Nathaniel Rochester. My love of motorsports started early, and it started with Watkins Glen. I remember attending my first NASCAR race at the track in 1997, when I was just nine years old watching Jeff Gordon winning his first Watkins Glen win. Just as you rejoin us, he took it away from uh, Jeff Bodine in the spot that he has made so many passes today in turn 10. Well, he has found him a sweet spot on that racetrack that that Chevrolet works right on, and he puts her right to the front. But my connection with Watkins Glen started much earlier. In elementary school, I was drawn to a book that transported me to another world. The year was 1948 when a select group of splendid amateurs gathered at Watkins Glen to revive a form of motorsport that had been ignored in America for 30 years. Oval track racing, epitomized by the Indianapolis 500, was our traditional style of competition. But racing on roads over natural terrain was distinctly European until a Watkins Glen resident talked the village fathers into staging a sports car race to boost the sagging tourist trade. Watkins Glen, New York is a town nestled in the heart of the Finger Lakes. Some fanciful giant is heralded as creating the Finger Lakes with the dredging fingers of his right hand, an artist's hand, surely. Watkins Glen was named after Dr. Samuel Watkins, who purchased the land here in the early 19th century. Situated at the southern tip of Seneca Lake, one of the largest of the Finger Lakes. This area quickly became known for its stunning waterfalls and lush landscapes. The centerpiece of Watkins Glen is the State Park. This town has a small town charm with quaint shops, cozy cafes, and historical buildings lining the streets. Watkins Glen always have been a hub of activity, but it wasn't until the mid 20th century that it became a hotspot for motorsports. It borders on the impossible to describe the difficulties and hazards of Cameron Argetsinger's circuit. Narrow and twisty, with an elevation change of over 500 feet between its highest and lowest points, it was at best a hodgepodge collection of public roads. Drivers navigated through the narrow streets, sharp corners, elevation changes, and a railroad crossing. 
It's among the most demanding circuits that were ever raced on. We were racing in cloth helmets and no seat belts. And it was just a big, wild adventure happening, which is retained today. However, the race success was overshadowed by a tragic incident in 1952. During the race, driver Fred Welker lost control of his car and struck onlookers sitting on the curb, resulting in the death of a seven-year-old boy and injuring 10 others. This is during a time when street racing was super dangerous. The only thing that was protecting the fans from the race cars from crashing are hay barrels. New York State outlawed racing on state roads in the ensuing Fuhrer, threatening to end competition at the Glen forever. As of this taping in 2024, organized street racing in New York are still banned. The streets used for this historic course remain preserved today, and you can actually still drive on this track. And it's completely insane that this was a real racetrack. In 1953, a new 4.6 mile or 7.4 kilometer layout was introduced. The track was still using existing public roads, but it was not owned by the state, so it's legal. The track was surrounded by farmland. So it had better safety measures than having it in the center of the village of Watkins Glen. In the same time, the Watkins Glen Grand Prix Corporation was established to manage spectators, parking, and concessions, ensuring a safer and more organized racing experience. The people of the community own the Watkins Glen Grand Prix. It's their corporation, and they have the say of it. In the late 1950s, the first permanent race course at Watkins Glen was constructed on 550 acres. Watkins Glen's first permanent track was designed by Bill Milliken. This track is a 2.350 mile layout. That's 3.782 kilometers. Milliken's track was a simple teardrop configuration that immediately became the fastest road course in North America. The original 1957 track was fast and narrow, and you can try it yourself on a set of Corsa and recreate 1950s Grand Prix moments. If you'd like to download the track mod, it's in the description below. In 1957, NASCAR made its debut with the Grand National Series at Watkins Glen, introducing a new type of racing to the track. The event returned in 1964 and 1965, showcasing the unique challenges of stock car racing on the road course. Watkins Glen continued to grow with Formula Libre races from 1958 to 1960. This format had a weird range of diverse race cars. It also attracted race car drivers like Phil Hill, Dan Gurney, and Sterling Moss. So Formula Libre is basically free formula in the format of racing. So there's basically no rules. So you'll have like a Formula One car or an Indy car racing against a stock car or a GT car. It's basically like an open lobby on your favorite sim game or my favorite week 13 on iRacing. It's just pure chaos. There you are, my beauty. In 1959, the United States Grand Prix at Sebring was the first Formula One race in America. But after a few unsuccessful attempts to host Formula One in the United States, from Sebring in 1959 to Riverside, California in 1960, promoters were on the hunt for a new venue. In 1960, Watkins Glen was awarded to host the United States Grand Prix. The Watkins Glen Grand Prix race course quickly became a favorite among drivers and fans alike. Its blend of high-speed straights, sweeping corners, and elevation challenges offered a unique and demanding test. After a decade of use, the cars began to overwhelm the circuit. Lap speeds were knocking on 130 miles an hour, and the course was criticized as too narrow and too confined for safety. Accidents increased. In 1971, Watkins Glen underwent a massive transformation. The circuit was renovated to enhance safety and improve the racing experience. The Big Bend section of the original circuit and the corners leading up to it were replaced with a new pit straight and moving the start and finish line. The most significant addition was the new segment known as the Boot, a four-turn complex that added a thrilling downhill and uphill challenge through the woods. 
This new layout extends the track to 3.37 miles. That's 5.435 kilometers and became known as the Grand Prix Circuit. This new configuration offered a fresh and challenging experience. Watkins Glen became a beloved stop on the Formula One calendar. The track now is one of the most beautiful racetracks in the world today, and you know, I can only compliment everyone for it. The reason why Watkins Glen was so important to me is that I know someone who was there in the early 1970s during the Formula One era. Hey, Dan. Hey, Dan. Mila decides to enter the chat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, literally walked in. Yeah. <laughs> so, when was your first time at Walking Fun track? Oh, it, it was around 72, 1972. The reason why was my family ran the con food concessions at Watkins Glen. So I was going down to the track to help out in, in the stands and set things up for the races for the food. Also, too, we provided food for uh, some of the parties. Lotus or someone had a party underneath the tent. We provided the food for that. Any uh, drivers that you serve food with? Uh, you uh, remember? Yeah, I served food and I drank a little bit with them. I met um, uh, Jackie Stewart, Mario Andretti, but there were probably other drivers I met there that I just don't remember or I had too much beer that night. Um, <laughs> I remember there was a comment that uh, met um, Mario's son. Michael. Michael. And we were talking, and I think you were with me. Yeah, when we went to the first Formula E weekend at uh, the New York City Grand Prix uh, yes. a couple years ago, yes. uh, we met Michael Andretti there. And uh, we were talking about some of the you know, get-togethers and stuff like that. And he, Michael mm -hmm. made a comment that, oh, that's why my dad didn't win that race that time. Yeah, I remember that. He made that comment to him that why, you did, why his dad didn't uh, win that weekend. In Watkins Glen, New York, hundreds of thousands of young people gathered for an all-day rock concert. Estimates of the crowd have ranged from 300,000 to half a million. Or as one person said today, it was 95 acres of wall-to-wall -wall people. In 1973, a major event transformed the track. Today, 120 miles away, there is in the making Woodstock's apparent successor, a thing called Summer Jam. The biggest rock music gathering in four years. Maybe the biggest ever. Estimates of the crowd now crammed together at Watkins Glen, New York, range from 300,000 to 500,000 people. Highways leading to the concert were packed for the last few days, with traffic at a crawl or a standstill. At some points, cars were backed up for 15 miles. To put in perspective, this festival was bigger than Woodstock 69. The concert, featuring the Grateful Dead, to be followed by the Allman Brothers and the band. Summer Jam 73 sold about 150,000 tickets, but as more fans arrived, the event evolved into what is known to become a free concert. Did you get sure. stuck there? Uh, <laughs> yes, a lot of us were stuck there. Uh, my sleeping area was in the back of a tractor trailer on bags of uh, popcorn and other stuff. That's how we slept out there. No water to shower or clean up for the longest time. Uh, we had a um, security team, which we hired uh, Hell's Angels to walk us back to the main area there with money that they worked with our off-duty police officers which i knew quite well to take care of the funds and get it out of the out of the area there there was cars parked and vehicles all over up the hills down the hills behind the hills all the way to montour falls stories of folks abandoning their cars and walking endless miles to get their cars were left behind the stage and track officials have taken me there to see the rusted relics so we had um made arrangements for food to be flown into us <clears throat> and they brought it in by um helicopter and dropped it off just like it would be a, a military maneuver and they would come down and put pallets out of the helicopters into our compound area that we had a compound around the main concession stand. So they brought it in like that because there's no way trucks or anything else were getting in there. 
No way at all. Summer Jam 73 was just more than a concert. It was an unforgettable experience for peace, music, and community. In 1973, the racing world was hit with another tragedy with the death of Francois Sever. I remember going through the fast S's at Watkins Glen. I uh, saw the yellow flag and uh, I knew if someone crashed, that was going to be tough. I immediately slowed down my car and I saw just, you know, the back end of the tiro sticking outside of the hump like that. In response, officials added a chicane, known as the Sheckler chicane, in 1975. This chicane slows the speech through the dangerous S's section. Despite these safety improvements, the increasingly faster and stiffer ground effect cars of the late 1970s highlighted the track's limitations. Pretty gro uh, gross uh, from the understanding of it. Mm -hmm. It was pretty bad. It was, it was a pretty bad situation. Uh, it was... It yeah. It was featured in the movie Rush. And reports are reaching me that there has been a serious accident in qualifying. Uh, the identity of the driver we don't currently have at the moment, but as you can tell from all the activity going on behind me towards the track, it is clearly a grave incident indeed. We will of course have more information for you as and when we get it, but it is the sight and sound of Formula One nobody likes to see. In 1980, Alan Jones claimed victory for Williams, but the glory days were numbered. Himself for the first 90 degree right hander. PK right behind him. There's a lot of jostling in the back, a lot of dust being thrown up. And Alan Jones has gone off on the right hand side of the circuit, as have Andrea DeCesare. 1980 with the last Formula One race at Watkins Glen. Jones is the winner of the 1980 United States Grand Prix. By 1981, financial struggles and safety concerns took their toll. The International Auto Sport Federation removed the race from the schedule due to an unpaid debt. The loss of Formula One was a significant blow to the circuit, and the track struggled to survive. Cart took over the Formula One date in 1981, and that same year, the track filed for bankruptcy. The future of the track seemed very bleak. But in 1983, hope arrived. Corning's see-through vision saucepan is extraordinary. It never stains and withstands heat that turns ordinary saucepans into sauce. Perfect for the microwave. Cleans up in a snap. Vision's range-top cookware. It makes a great gift, too, from Corning, that little blue flower, and a whole lot more. Corning Enterprises partnered up with International Speedway Corporation purchased the track. They renamed the track to Watkins Glen International. In 1984, the newly renovated track reopened. The chicane at the S's was removed. IMSA made a return to the track with the Camel Continental. Steve, and it's a drag race to turn one with Craig Carter in that beautiful blue and yellow V6 Camaro winning it. But look at this, from the inside, four starting position, Gene Felton in that white Oldsmobile Cutlass noses its way into second place. In 1986, NASCAR's top series made its long-awaited return to Watkins Glen. The pace car pulls off, here comes the field down, they get the green flag, and the Budweiser at the Glen. Winston Cup race is underway, we're glad you're with us on this Sunday afternoon. Stay with us for an afternoon of exciting racing. <laughs> they almost yep, touched. Got it. They got it. it. And Darryl, they're Dale Earnhardt moving in oh. to third position, and he's off the track, but... <laughs> That, late, late, that late breaking will do that to you. <laughs> Got off the great. track yeah. just momentarily, but did a great job of driving. Oh. It's in corner number seven. Tim Richmond is about to win the Budweiser at the Glen. He raises his hand, comes off the seventh corner, gets a little bit sideways, the back tires off the course, but it doesn't make any difference. Tim Richmond has won the Budweiser at the Glen. In 1991, Watkins Glen faced two devastating incidents that led to a massive overhaul of the circuit's safety. Back live at Watkins Glen, we've had another big crash in the Turn 5 area. It's one of the Chevrolet-powered Intrepid cars, either Tommy Kendall or Wayne Taylor. It's the 65 car, and that is Kendall. Let's take another look. Trailing Jeff Brabham's Nissan into the corner. And the car just comes around. One of the rear wheel spats comes. The yeah, rear wheel like came off. Rear wheel came right off the car, and this is a hard hit. Oh. 
Good grief, that was a horribly hard Driver hit. Tommy Kendall suffered a severe leg injury in a crash at turn five. Headed for turn number six. Speed increasing once again, second gear And turn. here's trouble, big trouble here in turn five. Oh, a car is upside down. NASCAR Cup Series driver J.D. McDuffie tragically lost his life during the Budweiser at the Glen. These incidents call for urgent safety improvements of the track. In response, track officials added a bus stop chicane to the back straight of the spring of 1992. In 1996, we saw the return of the classic six hour sports car race, now called the six hours of the Glen under the IMSA format. This race became a staple until the split of American sports car racing in 1998. In 1999, the FIA GT Series staged a 500 kilometer race at Watkins Glen. The six hour race returned the following year, sanctioned by the newly founded Grand American Road Racing Association, or it's known as Grand Am. Today, the six hours at Watkins Glen is a part of the Enzo WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. In 1997, ISC Corporation now owns Watkins Glen. After a 25-year hiatus, Major League Open Wheel Racing returned to Watkins Glen in 2005 as part of the Indy Racing League schedule. In 2010, IndyCar and ISC were having a dispute, and IndyCar won't return for six years. However, Watkins Glen continued to host NASCAR and IMSA events. And will the nine help him? Oh, can Ambrose save it to the checkered flag? Who gets here first? Clear, clear. Ambrose, Come back to you. nine, Keselowski, two, final quarter. Marcus Ambrose is going to win at Watkins Glen in a remarkable last lap turn of events. In 2011, a unique event took place. NASCAR driver Tony Stewart and Formula One driver Lewis Hamilton swapped cars for the day. We have Lewis Hamilton with us and Tony Stewart. This was also the first time in years that a modern Formula One car was on the racing surface at Watkins Glen. Corvette and the stock car be like in a minivan. <laughs> well, very different revs on these cars, of course, Formula One compared to the Impala, about 18,000 RPM on the McLaren. Interestingly, when the two cars were circulating earlier on, guys, you heard a lot of radio chatter. Even on a demonstration run like this, that constant feedback from the driver to the engineers. What's the grip like? What's the radio like? Can you hear me? Can I hear you? Corner by corner by corner, Larry, as the guys try and learn the track. Watkins Glen International is a track with rich history in motorsport. It's now looking towards an exciting future. Could Formula One make a grand return to this iconic circuit? According to motorsports.com, there's a call among fans and some officials to see Formula One cars racing through the scenic hills of the Finger Lakes region again. The financial and logistic hurdles are immense. A return to Formula One would not only require significant state funding, but also a long-term commitment to maintain a high standards demanded by the sport. Jalapalink highlighted another critical point. Even if the upgrades were made, the charm and character of Watkins Glen might be altered significantly. The character that makes Watkins Glen so special could be at risk with the massive modifications needed for Formula One. Uh, after Summer Jam 73, you haven't returned to the track. Uh... Oh, I returned to the track and I returned to the track with you a number of times. <laughs> Correct? Uh, so that was, yeah, 97. Yeah, yeah. I think you and I should make a return visit there, Dan. I think we should. <laughs> I go down for a race, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I do want to go back there uh, at least one more time, hopefully yeah. soon. Turn on the course, Jeff Gordon has won the Bud at the Glen, his eighth win of the 1997 season, his 27th career. Thank you for joining me on the history of Watkins Glen International. Please give this video a like if you really enjoy it. Also subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna have a lot more videos like this. This particular episode of Track History took three months to make. Uh, there's so much work that has to go into a video like this. From the research, the script writing, the storyboarding, the filming, and the post-production process. And I wanna thank you again for watching this episode of Track History on Watkins Glen. Let me know down below of what other tracks you want me to cover. I will see you again soon. Until then, take care. Shh. <laughs>
Three, two, one. <sighs> There's actually a thunderstorm rolling in while I'm my taping right now, and my dog is freaking out. So you might see her in the background. Hi, you okay? Oh, hi, 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 hi. You scared? You scared of the thunderstorm? You scared of the thunderstorm? Mila has to make an appearance on these videos at least once. Shall we continue? <laughs> in 1971, let's make sure we're recording. 